Yes, another big guest, uh, Lee Clark. I'm still waiting. Oh, for the, the signature. <laughs> What's happening? Uh, you pissed at us, didn't you, at the, uh, at the race course. What I lost your number. <laughs> By the way, I've been told you keep a watches after it, and I, was, I had an absolute shock uh, didn't I? Well, I was always watching you. I thought uh, you caught my eye when you were playing for Swindon, and uh, same when Paul Caddis, so I ended up having it Birmingham and uh, Berry. So... Uh, but you were probably more expensive than Caddy, so I probably couldn't. I couldn't afford you. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great. Was that the unseen trainers by that's the way? That's it. That's them. That's How them. did you manage to see it? Oh, ah, yeah, yeah. Hey, listen, got links everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you know, I've got a couple of pairs of belts. Aye, ah, yeah, aye, definitely. I must say, you're looking great, mate. Aye, lost a bit of weight, and uh, so looking after myself again. Maybe try and get the boots back out. Well, I, I do play with my pals five aside. Uh, you know, so t once or twice a week down at uh, one of the Power League uh, AstroTurf pitches, we just stick a fiver in a man and have a kick about. You still got it? That means you kind of lose what you never had. <laughs> <laughs> no, mate, you were a player. I've heard you were an absolute player. Uh, Blythe Spartans just now? Aye, tough. Surely you'll sign us for Blythe Spartans, come on. I definitely are, you and Caddy get you back together. <laughs> How's it going, all right? Ah, uh, tough, tough at the moment, you know. We've, uh, new league for me, part-time, um, the club lost 16 players over the summer and we tried to replace them. We tried to go with lads from lower level who found it a bit difficult. Um, had a heavy defeat last night after getting someone sent off after 10 minutes. So, tough, but that's what the challenges are all about. As I said, something different for me would be in part-time when you have the players two nights a week um, and then play on a sat in football is a secondary job, really. They've all... Been grafting all day. Aye, aye, yeah. tough. So, like last night, a couple of lads looked a little bit off the pace, but when you're sitting chatting with your staff, you understand why. They've probably been doing a 12 hour shift before the game or something. That must be hard for you, though, where you've managed and the aye, places you've it, it, it is, but it's. I still enjoy the Tuesdays and Thursday nights doing the coaching. Obviously, the results at this moment in time aren't where we want them to be, so that hurts. So, I've still got the passion for the game, no matter what level I'm uh, working at. So, um, Let's see if we can just try and improve them over the course of the season. Right, on to your career now. Uh, grew up a Newcastle lad. Newcastle fan, born and bred. Absolutely, yeah. First game, 1980. Wasn't a particularly good era for the club. We were uh, didn't have a great side, but um, stood in the famous Gallagher end and uh, watched the team. And then two years later, the club took off. We signed uh, the European footballer of the year, Kevin Keegan, the most high-profile footballer in Britain at the time. And... Uh, Club was in equivalent to the championship now, it was League One then, uh, or League Two, sorry, and um, Keegan walked through the door and from then on in, the club was big news. Was he your hero, Keegan? Well, obviously, he was everyone's hero, he was, he was untouchable. When he came, the crowds went from 14,000 to 32, 33,000, sellout capacity. Um, a young Chris Waddle was in the team then. And then a young Peter Beardsley got signed. Terry McDermott arrived because he was big friends with Kevin from the Liverpool days. So with that four, you weren't destined to do anything but get promoted. So the, it was an exciting period. The games were brilliant. The, the amount of goals that were scored. So he was obviously one. He was the untouchable Kevin. And then obviously, for me as a local guy, you were looking at like Chris Waddle and, and Peter Beardsley were the two that you looked up to. So. Further down the line in the 90s when I played alongside Peter, being managed by Kevin and Terry was assistant. It was a little bit surreal, Amazing. really. Who would you go against? Where your dad? My dad, my mates, my brother, uh, any family, any kind, you know, really. So it was... Um, and I remember in that era as well, uh, in the festive games, there was no public transport. So used to, I used to live on the banks of the Tyne in the east of the city, called a place called Walker, then Wall's End. Oh, and, Walker, uh, I know that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, no, it, we, people from there didn't have a lot of uh -huh. uh, things going for them. They just had the love of football, probably. And uh, so it was, a, you know, we used to have to walk to the matches in the festive period. And, uh, you know, it was good banter. All the fans would be congregating together. And if you were with your dad or your older brother, they'd be stopping off at the pub. And so it would take a little bit longer than you thought. But all great experiences. Uh -huh. How did you get picked up for Newcastle? Well... I was um, playing for my school and then and then the city team and then got taken to the very famous Walls End Boys Club that's produced many, many uh, footballers uh, for the professional game and certainly in the Premier League as well. And um, and then 
they obviously came used to come to those games and had scouts and uh, there was no academies then it was what called centre of excellences and uh, so I joined at about 10, 11 years of age and then at 14 signed for schoolboy forms for them well signed a contract that from 14 to 21 really which enabled schoolboy forms uh, YTS scheme and then a professional contract Who were some of the players that you came through because see when you mentioned Beardsley and Waddle they always think of Alan Thompson when he was at Celtic if he hit a shot and goal he'd shout Beardsley or Waddle <laughs> that was his shout was it guys like Alan Thompson well, that you came our, through our group uh, from Walls End Boys Club and also who uh, were at the, in, the, in the youth team together um, was a, a goalkeeper called Ian Bennett who played lower leagues I actually managed him at Huddersfield Ian had a very successful career uh, Steve Watson uh, oh, yeah. Alan Thompson uh, Steve Howie Robbie Elliott um, obviously myself um, a lad called Lee Makel who works up at Hibs Hib uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. and now works at Hibs went to Blackburn um, Alan Nielsen who played for Newcastle and went to Southampton so there was there was a lot of us who from that youth team made the grade and, uh, and went on to have careers at, at various different clubs at different levels. Was that a lively, knowing a couple of the boys, was that a lively youth team? Oh, just a bit, yeah. It was, uh, <laughs> there was absolute carnage going on most days at uh, the training ground. I mean, it was the days where we had to look after boots and kit for pros and all that. And so we'd be there early in the morning cleaning the dirty boots in a, in a like old wooden hut, which was freezing in the winter. So you can imagine there was some uh, shenanigans going on between when uh, when we were growing up Gaza was around Gaza was a, a young pro obviously the up and coming thing the big thing and we've seen some crazy thing we, he got he hid in a commercial uh, dryer you know the, what the kit men use <laughs> uh, when when some one of the other players one of the senior players was after him a guy called Billy Whitehurst who was a real tough nut and Gaza kept sticking the ball through his legs and training and Billy said to him one day in, in no uncertain terms, do that again and yeah, history. So Gaza done it again, ran off and hid in this dryer and they switched the dryer on, aren't they? <laughs> Just the slowest spin and there's Gaza. Maybe that's the answer to why things are going a little bit downhill at the moment. But uh, great guy, he, he was very supportive of the young players because he'd come through that route himself. Um, and was an unbelievable talent. Uh, but some of the things he'd done in and around the training ground. And as I said, we used to get changed as well in a little room that used to be the old boot room. So it was tiny. So there was about 16 or 17 of us in there. The banter that was flying about. And when it was our birthdays, you know, we got jumped on with and deep heat and boot polish and Vaseline. So it was uh, interesting times. Would guys ever take you it for a night? I well, he'd, he'd take it out. And uh, he loved his fishing, and we, we, we just sort of feel we used to go around and go a bit fishing with him, and uh, take it to a cafe in between St James's Park and the training ground. And I, as many many times we've had social times with him, he was he was he was different class with us, you know. And, and even when he became the super superstar that he was of his generation, whenever we bumped into him, uh, be home or abroad, he always looked after him. Brilliant. Uh, in terms of older players, you said Billy Whitehouse, coaches as well, were they ruthless for, with young players back then? Oh, aye. I mean, uh, the, the, the youth team coaches, um, you know, having to, the, the running that were done, and we didn't have a, the all weather pitch we had was a gravel pitch, so yeah, and you were sl trying to have do sliding tackles on it, and you were gashed, and the, we had an old gymnasium with like, the basic uh, astroturfing but it just had breeze block walls and we used to be bouncing each other into those walls and I mean at the end of the season our jobs were to paint the training ground and the, the, the youth team coach Colin Suggett would go across the top of the door frames which you couldn't really reach and to check if, the, um, if there was any dust if there was we had to redo the whole training ground again and so it was a it was a tough school but a one that gave where you know uh, great discipline and um, made me realise when we did eventually become pros what we had. See, when you got into the first team, were you a bit intimidated or were you kind of loud? No, I was, you I, was very, I was very, co very cocky. Um, in fact, when um, before I got in the first team, um, at my three professionals was a young striker called David Robinson, uh, a Danish striker called Frank Pingle who played in the first team and Mickey Quinn. They were my, uh, my pros and... Um, 
one day on the Saturday, Frank had scored a ridiculously own goal against Coventry at St James's and we'd lost 1-0 and, and we're in the boot room and the old wire brushes that used to take the mud off the boot scar scarifiers are here. come across the back of my hand it was all gosh and I said to the lads, listen, Frank, I'm cleaning his boots and I'm, he's absolutely rubbish like. <laughs> so I, I took his kit in like with his boots blood all over my hand and I said, Frank, listen, it's the last day I'm doing your boots. I says, I'm 16, mate, I'm better than you. <laughs> and he's like, Lee, you probably are. And uh, I looked across and Quinny said, you say that to me, pal, and you'll be getting a right hook. <laughs> so I would never have said it to Quinny, like, and, uh, but Quinny, obviously, great goal scorer. And uh, when they talk about all the stats now, and they talk about assists, I probably got 27, 28 assists for Quinny that season. I didn't play because I cleaned his boots. <laughs> ah, they were my assists, so. Um, Would he sort you? Would he sort you? That's, well, the story was, I thought, I was giving it the big into the lads at Christmas time coming up, and I was like, ah, oh, Quinny, he's on like, he must, I think he was on about 25 goals at the time. He had a ridiculous season. And I was like, the lads, ah, oh, Quinny's going to weigh us in, lads. Got to give us at least a ton. Uh, and if he does, we're out. Like, I'll take you out. I'll sort out all the drinks. And I say, so, so I was giving it the big in for a couple of weeks. And he came in this morning, he says, come and see us up the train. I've got your Christmas present. So I thought, yeah, brilliant. And as that goes in, he hands us a, a bag. And I looks in it, and it was a Nike T-shirt, but I don't know if you remember Quinny, he was a big guy. Yeah. And when I opened the T-shirt out, it was obviously one that would been sent for him. It was, so it doubled up as a, <laughs> as a continental quilt for us. And so when I walked back in with my tail between my legs, because I'd been giving it the big end to the other lads, they were just bursting out. They, they, they were laughing, but they were also gutted because they were hoping for a night like, out yeah. off the back of me. So Surely you came them for getting you that T-shirt, sir? Eh? Surely you caned him and said, where's the oh, money? Oh, no, no, I, I wouldn't cane Quinny. He would have no. just clipped us. Aye, no, you, no, you, you knew, like, uh, you know, you, I knew Frank was a nice bloke and he wouldn't respond. But if I had said, like, and I had a, a pad of pop at Quinny, um, have it would have been a right hook coming my way. But there was obviously some guys I played with that you would know very well, Mark McGee. Yeah. Uh, Roy Aitken was my How partner. Was Roy Aitken's one of my questions. How was he? Scary. Roy was uh, a great guy. Obviously, came, he was massive. I think he was... Uh, I don't know if he still is, record appearance holder for Celtic. He was at the time. He's obviously sure. captain of Scotland. Yeah. And uh, so he gets him down. And um, I remember one game, my debut, one of my first games on my debut, and James, we had Jim Smith, who was frightening Jim yeah. as a manager, especially for me being 17. He gives me debut. And uh, he's like, Roy, Roy, you're captain of Scotland. What's going on? You're useless, man. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm thinking he's coming to me next. What's he going to be saying? He bypassed us and all that. And, but Roy and Mark, uh, Mark was a, a top player. and they, knew, they were experienced. They knew how to handle Jim at the time. Mickey Quinn, Kevin Dillon, John Burridge, all these guys. Ray Ranson had a lot of experience. So they knew how to handle me. I was a little bit intimidated. I'd only been 17. Um, now I look back, you know, um, Jim was a good manager, just obviously too 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 strong with sure, the time. Yeah. Well, not too strong. He just obviously, when you're only 17, you get a bit intimidated by that. But uh, those guys were different class for me. The, you know, to be alongside them. Um, obviously, I've managed against um, Mark as well up in Scotland right. since then, and obviously, so it's it's a bit weird for him seeing that he was the senior pro and I was the youngster in the group. Um, so it's it's. But it was a good good grounding for Can you us. remember your debut? Me, me, me initial debut was coming on as a sub for Neil Simpson, ex Aberdeen. Right, uh huh. Uh, Simo got injured after about half an hour down in Bristol City, September uh, 1989. And, uh, uh, sorry, 1990. And um, came on after half an hour. So, and then the week after was my full debut at home to West Brom. At St James's? Aye. Can you know, were you starting? I started nil-nil. You know the night before you were starting? Uh, I had an idea because Jim was big on doing his team shape on a Thursday and that, right. but without naming the team, so you didn't want to count your chickens. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was daunting. I, the game, I can't remember a lot about the game. Part of them was a, a horrible nil-nil against West Bromwich Albion. So, uh, and so it's, I think the, the, the occasion passed us by, but at the time as well, uh, I couldn't drive. It took us a while before I passed my driving test, and um, I used to get the bus from my house to the to the stadium. And the driver used to let us off with a bus fare. 
because uh, so, obviously they knew who I was when I was getting on the bus, so it was a little... Now you see the young lads pulling up in Lamborghinis and all that. Bro, you know Was your, was your dad and pals not in the game or her? Aye, aye, all of them, my family, um, brother and sisters, brother-in-laws. And Does nothing beat the debut playing for your hometown team? You're living the dream, aren't you? Was there anything in your career that surpassed that at all? Nah. Nah. You know, um, the best thing that happened is I started my career and then un unbelievably never ever thought it would happen. I ended my career there as well, mm. so playing wise, and um, and that was that's living the dream. I, I see it now when I go back, and you think, you know, that you performed in front of this in the stadium in big Premier League games and Champions League games and Europa League. It was UEFA Cup uh, when I played, but it, you know now known as Europa League. So uh, great, great. How was your mates for you when you make, make your debut in that and you're in uh, ah, Newcastle? Uh, they were buzzing as well. Ah, uh, yeah, just like me just couldn't believe it had happened you know it was because uh, when I first went to watch you never ever think that you're going to be uh, getting chosen to play because you don't know how ultimately they end up becoming Newcastle United footballers so you just think that something different happens to them so you know as but as you get older uh, you know you get the opportunity so and it was it was living the dream basically uh, amazing uh, it's mentioned Jim Smith screwball uh, what's the worst you've seen him Crack? Oh, full teapots, tea, teacups. Um, one of the funny stories was when, when I made my debut for a home game, we used to have to wear our own shirt and tie and jacket, so I went and sport, spent 25 quid in C&A on a full outfit. <laughs> and uh, when I got in the dressing room, all the senior lads were hanging their nice suits up and putting towels across their suits. And I thought, oh, well, this must be what you do when you're an established pro. So I just hung my suit up, I didn't put a towel over it. And when we came in at half time, Jim picked up the old silver teapot and with the cups and threw it at the wall and the tea went everywhere. <laughs> and that's the reason why that there was no, it was no, it wasn't any uh, uh, scale of what where you were in the pecking order, it was just, they were protecting their suits. suits. <laughs> aye, aye. So did you put the suit on with the tea all over it? Aye, hey listen. It didn't really spoil it. It was a minion outfit in any way, to be fair. <laughs> but something's never changed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did it come a bit of a surprise when Ozzy Ardiles replaced Jim? Aye, but for us, uh, the young players, Ozzy gave us our head. Um, still keep in touch with him. I'm actually doing a gig with him um, next month for Walls End Boys Club. And uh, he was a great man. He was... He was a young, he was for the young players, like I, I talked about all them young players before, he give, put us all in the team together. There was exciting games, would be, there was lots of 4-4s four and getting beat 5-4 after being 3-0 up. And the first ever live game on Sky was a cup competition called the Simod Cup and it was Newcastle v Tramia. And we played in it and we drew six each in, in, in a normal game and then it went to penalties and Sky must have thought, well, we hope all these games are going to be <laughs> like this. And then, and then Quinney scored four and John Aldridge scored four for them or three. They both got hat tricks, I know that. And this was down to Aussie. We weren't allowed to call him Boss or Gaffer, we had to call him Aussie. He had Tony Galvin with him, the ex Tottenham winner. Yeah. And he was just a, he was a great man. It was, a, uh, even though it was a tough period for him because what was happening behind the scenes, the club was uh, wanting to be, it was a group called the Magpie Group, which had been run by Sir John Hall, who eventually bought the club, was wanting to buy the old regime out because there was no finance. And uh, Ozzy was stuck in the middle, really. Didn't really have a lot of finance. We bought a player called David Kelly, a striker, and Ozzy actually bought him out of his own money for no a quarter, quarter of a million pound. And it was like interest loan, interest uh, free loan to the club. So he eventually got that money back, but he didn't know with the predicament the club was in. So it was a tough period. And when he when he left, it was um, it was hard for all us young lads because we, we took stuck up a great relationship with him. But he was funny. He'd, um, he'd be signing photos of him alongside Diego Maradona and he'd say like, things like, Clarky here. And he used to say, I made him <laughs> about Maradona. And uh, so... Um, Legend. I... <laughs> He's won the big one, hasn't yeah. he? The World Cup. So, wow. and he was a, a fantastic football. I mean, in training. Did he join in at her? I, hey, listen, most of the managers I played for were still top draw. I mean, him, Keegan, 
Daglish, Sunes, Tigana, uh, ridiculous Reedy, it's Sunderland. I mean, all top players, and uh, they were still still competitive. Uh, when when they joined in. See, our deal is, was it total football? Did he just want you to uh, express yourself? Yeah, yeah. Play, play, play was his partner. Um, we oh, played yeah. all. But it was That's what you wanted as a young kid. It, it, was, it was great and he's broken English. We're playing at Barnsley at Oakwell one day and he sat and he said, uh, well, uh, well, uh, obliquely the bitty bitty bubbly. And, uh, <laughs> but we still play, play, play. And I looked and he said, What's the matter, Clark? Are you not understand English? <laughs> and I thought, uh, a bit strange. But what a, a fantastic guy. And as I said, I've kept in touch with him. Um, he, when he left, uh, he went to West Brom, and then he went, he got the Tottenham job, and he was very interested in taking me to Tottenham. But oh, I'd have been decent that, wouldn't it? I, but I wasn't going to leave Newcastle at that stage um, to go to go there. But I still keep in touch now, uh, very regular. And as I said, we're meeting up in October to do a gig together for Wolves and Boys Club. Tremendous. So obviously you were gutted when he got sacked. Uh, we all were because he'd give us great belief in ourselves, he showed a great sort of faith, but that was tempered by the fact that the Messiah was coming back. Did you, how, how soon did you know that Messiah was coming? Well, it, it, it happened quite quickly within a, within a few hours. And were you, were you buzzing? Of course, I mean, you know, I'd been there to see him uh, absolutely change the club from a run of the mill, uh, mid-table, no ambition, uh, League One club now with the championship as I said to getting them in the top level exciting night, nights I mean remember it wasn't the television and live television of matches that there is now but Newcastle were when Kevin came as the first back as a player at first we were quite regular on the TV and uh, that was like quite unique for Newcastle fans to see that team in a live football match and it was because of what Kevin brought so he brought all this publicity and stardust when he played so to think uh, what he was going to do as a manager but no one ever believed what he what he how he was going to change things around from where the club was um, he came in three quarters into the season we just escaped relegation from the championship and then over that summer he rebuilt the squad and we ran away with the league and then got promoted and then every year in, there on in were were challenging to win the title. So what did he change with it? Just bringing in better players? Aye, experienced players, top quality players. I mean, w w John Beresford was on, had, had a fantastic run in the FA Cup with Portsmouth. He was on the verge of signing for Liverpool. Don't know what happened, don't know what happened with the breakdown of his talks there. We signed him, was left back. We signed Barry Venison, who was a who was a league winner with Liverpool, an FA Cup winner with Liverpool, so he'd played at the highest level at a huge club. Paul Bracewell had won big things with Everton. Who was going to end up being my mentor in midfield? Who was me and him? Um, he'd already signed a, a lead and Brian Kilclain, and you know he, he was always uh, developing the team. So it was, uh, it was. In, in in the newest days as well, there was no transfer window, so you could continually buy yeah. and buy and bring players in. So he was always enhancing the team, and then he, he brought. Scott Sellers in, who had a wand of a left foot. I mean, an unbelievable player. Kevin Sheedy, you know, as well. Um, we just had, uh, and then we just went on a run and we won the first 11 games out of 11 and we were just on a roll. And and then to cop, top everything off, he, he brought in Coley, Andy Cole um, from Bristol City and Coley just went on a ridiculous run in terms of scoring. Uh, and then, Obviously, we, as I said, we, we romped the championship, and uh, and then we got in the Premier League. And he was ruthless in his recruitment. I mean, David Kelly had scored over thirty goals to get us to the Premier League, and without playing a Premier League game, he sold them to Wolves and replaced them with Peter Beardsley. And so that's how he was doing it. He was, thanks very much, lads. You've you've done what, what I needed you to achieve. We're going to the next level. I'm not going in there as an old so run. I want to go in there and challenge. And that's what he said to us. What was so good about him though? Was that his enthusiasm, was he a man aye, manager, aye. coaching? Uh, not coaching, he, you know, in terms of, uh, understood the game, of course he did, he was a top player, so, uh, but it was his, his man management, his motivation, his passion, uh, the whole package, how he treat you, how he looked after you, you and your family, made you feel, uh, made everyone feel really great about themselves, got a great group of players together, 
molded them, molded a team, knew what he wanted, knew how to improve the team on a regular basis, um, and was just, you know, just led from the front. I mean, as I said, joined in most of the ses sessions in any way. Did you ever smash him? Oh, of course, aye, loads of times, aye. Did you, aye? aye there's certainly times when he left us out of the team and there was, I was, I was a bit of a hothead. I, I think he's seen, he was a manager who wore his heart on his sleeve. We knew what Kevin was about, we knew what mood he was in. And I think he's seen a little bit of that in me. And that's why I, I think we had a strong relationship. Did uh, he take to you straight away? Aye, I mean, it's, I was there from the first day he arrived till the day he left. I mean, even when you talk about, you know, his emotions, when I knew something up the day, the day he ended up quitting was we played Charlton in an FA club, cup tie down in the valley. And um, when he got on the bus, he, he looked really flat. Uh, we drew the game. We played all right. We you know, hadn't been poor or anything, but you know, we drew the game and um, he just looked very flat. And, and then it was announced later on that evening, early morning, that he's, he'd quit the club, which, which, which when we talk about you know, being shocked and gutted, the, the players were certainly absolutely, you know, totally gutted because he, he was the leader. He was the man who, who was taking us forward, was helping us to be part of a, of a group uh, that was, you know, everyone's favourite second team, really, yeah. I think. You know, in, in Sky had nicknamed us the entertainers, so it was, it was always, um, it was a great era to be part of. See, the promotion back to the Premier League, uh, how good's Newcastle when you're you're winning stuff? You've won a league and you're up to the. It was it was a, it was a roller coaster. Aye, I mean it, it took we from this hotel yeah. to the Civic Centre, which is three and a half four mile. It took us four or five hours on the open top bus. It was just absolute carnage. We were hanging on top of lamp posts and street lights, and uh, it was great. Um, Did you just go up with the fans as well? With the fan, we just get nights up with the fans. Ah, listen, that we had a, the, the relationship between the players and the fans then was unbelievably strong. That's one of the areas in today's world that I get disappointed about. Yeah. And, uh, and but we had great uh, times where after results, home or away, would be in town in the pubs in the nightclubs, and the fans would be there and the. the you know, never refused an autograph any any player or, or a picture. I mean, obviously, wasn't the camera phones there then? But so, but uh, no, a great, great relationship between players and fans. Who'd be the usual suspects? It would be who you'd be with. Everybody, the whole team, the whole group, and then and even, Kevin Keegan Courage. Yeah, of course, at the right time because he knew that we, we, we trained unbelievably hard. The tempo of the training, because the standard of the player was so high, and everyone was fighting to get in the team. We knew we had to impress Monday to Friday. But whenever we socialised as just players, everyone was there. But whenever we socialised with our wives or girlfriends, everyone was there again. Everyone was, no one was uh, not included on on the, on the nights out. No one never uh, not went. And we had a we had a great relationship. There'd be if we had any kind of parties back at the houses or whatever family celebrations, the whole squad was invited with our partners and all that. So it was it. it, it it showed in how we've done things on the pitch as well. Because uh, you finished third in the first season back in the Premiership. Uh, was that down to team spirit? I was down to good players yeah. and being a good team, but obviously the, the, the spirit that would, uh, you know, brought together because... But when I talk about spirit as well, we weren't frightened to... Um, Fight with each other? In, in, well, have debates, aye. Strong debates during training. Training was heated because everyone was wanting to win. Everyone was wanting to be picked on a Saturday. Uh, matches, uh, we weren't worried about falling out with each other over the course of the game. Um, and then we enjoyed each other's company afterwards. There was no fallout, there was no uh, follow on it's from that. Nah, no, exactly. Everyone was there to win. And if we had to give each other a little rattle to get the result, we'd done it. Brilliant. Uh, you mentioned Andy Cole. How did you know straight away that he was going to be a top top player? Well, I was good pals with him. Unbelievably, um, he's from Nottingham. He was playing for Arsenal at the time. Obviously, a Geordie playing for Newcastle. And we, when we got together for the England youth squads, me and him hit it off. So we could become good pals. And the morning he, we, we we signed him, Kevin, we were on our way to Swindon to play a game, and uh, we. Um, 
Kevin rang and said, I've got a surprise for you. And it's like, what? Oh, he says, oh, I've got your mate here. We, we just signed him from Bristol City. And uh, I think he made his debut that day down there as a sub. And then he, he just rocketed his, his goal record in the famous jersey, number nine jersey, uh, which is obviously famous for some unbelievable players wearing it and, and what they've done. Was ridiculous, you know. What kind of guy is? That? What kind of guy is Andy Cole? He's quiet. He's unassuming. People th uh, thought it was arrogance. It wasn't. He was very. Um, he found it difficult at first when he came because obviously it's like living in a goldfish bowl where every fan wants to support you. So you went to a shop. You went to a supermarket. You went to a restaurant. You went to a bar. You went to a fill your car up. Everyone wanted to talk about the team and, and talk about you. And Andy found that a little bit difficult. Uh, not because he was aloof or, or big time, it was not something he wasn't used, used to, yeah. you know. But, you know, he was, he, he, he was fine and obviously when he, when he got the move to Man United, that, that was a big shock. But it was Kevin then doing what he felt was right to then kick the team on again, yeah, you know. Uh -huh. So you being a local lad, like, see defeats and stuff like that, would you bear the brunt of it more than others? Uh, well, we felt it. I mean... We had an unbelievable record. I think we averaged June Kevin's years, six years or something, it averaged one home defeat per season. So we were very rarely lost. Yes. Um, so it was, yeah, whenever we did, it was uh, it was tough and it wasn't a feeling we were used to. So, it, you know, it, it didn't sit well with us. And what it meant was that it affected your weekend. You never went socialising when you lost football matches. You didn't go out in the town and all that. Um, I did. <laughs> That's why I'm sitting here. We didn't. Uh, <laughs> aye, we didn't. We, we, we felt it wasn't the right thing to do with the supporters. Uh -huh. uh, going into the 95 96 season, was there a genuine boy for you to in the league? Of course, we were getting better all the time. Some of the signings we'd made, Ferdinand had arrived. Um, yeah, Beardsley, Rob Lee, Ward, Gian Ginola, wow. well, well, Rob Lee came in the championship season, you know, I forgot to mention him, you know. And that's silly because he ended up being like, one of the club's best ever signings. Went from a right winger to a centre midfield player and um, unbelievable footballer. Great, great lad as well. I had a great relationship with Rob. And um, so, uh, Ginola. How good was Ginola? Unplayable. Unplayable. I mean, I've seen him just absolutely terrorise people. For the first six months I played with him, it was just like, wow, this guy's just like unstoppable. And uh, for what he didn't do without the ball, the rest of us were prepared to do a little bit extra because what he was doing with the ball, making and scoring of goals, was just on a different planet to what we'd been used to. We had him on one wing who loved to dribble, was strong as an ox, six foot odd. We had Gillespie on the other wing who was just rapid, uh, direct. And with them two, it was quite simple, easy to be a midfield player because you just the give them the uh -huh. ball. And then obviously you've got Ferdinand and Beardsley up top. Um, which was, you know, he, Les, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. But Is one he, of the, ah, yeah, fantastic. Good laugh. Great guy, great guy, but uh, fantastic footballer as well, but just so humble, so so nice. Who would you been like, see when you're going for leagues and it's that top end premiership football, do you still get characters and jokers in the dressing room or is it all quite serious? Oh no, that, that was, a, that dressing room was crazy. Yeah. How about what sort of stuff? Well, for example, later on, when Shira arrived and uh, Aspia arrived, there was like, oh, it went through a stage where we're just cutting sleeves off each other's clothes, the, the toes out the socks, so when they put them on, they were up, and Tino was bearing the brunt of it most occasions. Philippe Albert was a great, a great laugher. What a footballer he was, by the way. I mean, wow, centre-half. He was one of the, the first ever centre-halves to come out and talk about playing from the back. He would just... He, I've seen him go up the full length of the pitch playing give and goes with people. He was uh, he was phenomenal, and he he, he loved the he loved the, the the laugh and the banter with the lads. So some crazy things gone on, but uh, great spirit, great yeah. spirit. See, do you know, obviously, a god in there. He's gorgeous. He was gorgeous, isn't he? Oh, oh you were the stand next time in the team oh, photo, either. No, but you did on a night out. Love that man. Uh, would he have been the best that you played at Newcastle, do you know? That? Well, talent wise, for the first six months, as I said, unplayable. And then obviously you have the, the you know, the godlike uh, Shira, Shira for the goals. But in terms of ability wise, 
Beardsley was the standout player. Beardsley was he, I, For me, I mean, some of the things he could do with the football and a maker and taker of goals. And the talk about the new systems now and the number 10. Peter was the original number 10 without it being a position then. And if you, you know, he was, he was like that in the World Cup when he, he assisted Lineker with all them goals. Brilliant. Uh, was the style of play that season the best Newcastle's ever seen? Well, that's what they say. Do you people, think, people do you still think talk about the era now, that all the fans that, when we go, if we ever go back to St James's or they stop us in the street and they want to talk about it, they see it and they, they, as I said, they were everyone else's second favourite team and Sky dubbed us the entertainers and we were on on a regular basis, live on television, no matter where we were playing home or away and we never changed our philosophy. So. It was phenomenal, the goals, the amount of goals we scored and um, the manager was just, if they score three, we score four, if they score four, we score five and uh, it would be better if we kept a clean sheet but it wasn't a be all and end all and he just made sure that we uh, went out and attacked teams. So local lad, top of the Premiership, is that, we treated like a king in Newcastle, huh? Oh, I was saying, when you play for Newcastle United, it even doesn't matter how things are going, you get treated very well off yeah, the people, yeah. right? Even if going great, huh? Well, I was, you know, not trying to sound big-headed. I wasn't really part of a team that... Didn't do well, did, huh? Aye. The only time was probably under Aussie, but we were young players and the fans were very appreciative of the young players coming through. They could see we had talent. We were just a little bit naive, 16, 17, 18 at the time. So, and they could see we were... And we, we got a little bit of leeway because we were one of them. We were local lads as well, do you know what I mean? So You said previously that dropping you for David Batty affected the title run. You still go with it? Aye, of course. 12 points clear on my last game at Main Road. But when I talk about David Batty, I don't talk about him in a negative way. He was a fantastic footballer, international footballer, brilliant lad, could pass a ball. But just the way we were set up at the time, I'd been an attacking midfield player, I'd been converted to be the deeper midfield player. I wouldn't say defensive midfield player, because I'm not sure Kevin ever wanted a defensive midfield player, but I was the deeper one who would start our attacks. Because of me forward thinking in terms of me attacking mode, we could get the passes into in between the lines very quickly. And uh, I just felt David was a great signing, a fantastic signing. But, you know, we, we had rhythm and um, I didn't play in the last nine games of the season and we were 12 points clear when I got taken out of the side. So I'm always going to back my uh, own judgment on that. Would you go and see Keegan oh, as regular. soon as you were Ah, of course. And what would his excuse No, be? he wasn't. He was very open. He was honest. And so he would, you know, probably say that he felt David was better for the role. So... Which, in all honesty, David had played that type of role, and as I said, he was a terrific footballer. I just felt the continuity we had in the team at the time. So yeah, there was. I always had conversations, and Kevin was good. He would always, if he dropped you, he would always give you an explanation to, uh, in his office for what the reasons were. He would never hide from from that situation. Mm. Uh, Saying an Espria, was that a positive or a negative? Positive. Is he a madman? Huh? Absolutely crazy. There's <laughs> bigger nutter than he came across on the telly. He came across as a nutter on the telly as well. Uh, I mean, coming back from Colombia with a little bit of a bullet wound in his calf. Never, we thought it was from a bad tackle, and he said it was from a bullet wound. And uh, <laughs> you know, so um, Pali with Pablo Escobar and all that. So <laughs> that it, that's it used to say it all, doesn't it? If that's if that's one of you have good mates, you know you're a bit of a crazy oh, horse. Wow. He used, he, to shop, he used to shop at the Disney World shop, shop, so he used to come in with a white shirt with Tweety Pie on and the lads <laughs> would cut his sleeves off and cut it up and you'd hear you Geordie B's and all that and it was uh, just, just crazy. Um, I remember his debut it down at Middlesbrough. We played away and it was the first time we'd met him. He was in for pre-match meal and uh, he had a half a carafe of red wine with his food and this must be been thing in Italy, in Parma when he was, and he, he was sub, and we were like thinking, wow, he's having a few drinks before the game, and he came on sub, and he set up the winner for Steve Watson. We beat Middlesbrough down there in a, in a local derby 2-1, and we thought, this guy's a magician, and obviously the night against Barcelona, when he scored the hat-trick, showed you what a type of player he was, but he was, he was just a phenomenon. He was, he, 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 he had these funny gangly legs, but he could just like be in control of the ball. So at the time, we had four strikers and the four were 
zu fast die neue Spieler. Les Ferdinand, Alan Shearer und Peter Beardsley. Wow. Und die waren die Selection Dilemmas, die der Manager hatte. Und um, wir hatten ein bisschen Spiel. Um, wir gingen in Europa und eigentlich alle vier von ihnen waren injured. Uh, wir spielten uh, Monaco, John Tigana's Monaco. When probably I think I ended up having to play up front in one of the games because we none of those guys were fit, and you think what that that four strikers would be worth today, man? Mm -hmm. It'd be like wow, scary. Would they four get on or with the competition for places? Oh, or? I got on. Listen, everyone got on. Yeah. You know, I, but they big names when they get left out. How did they take it? Well, it was hard, and and sometimes all the, the, they didn't. You know, Peter would maybe play a bit of a deeper role and. Uh, it'd be Alan and Les as the front two and um, all that so and maybe Fastino coming off the bench or playing in a wide area so you know it was it, it, Kevin handled the situation very well he, he kept all the players happy in terms of um, being open and honest with them it's difficult when you've got so many uh, big players and big egos but he, he handled it well I love this video man Ah, uh, he's cr loved crackers, it. man, crackers. <laughs> uh, was there feeling around, what was the feeling around the dressing room when the gap started to close in Man United? No, there wasn't any talk of it. I mean, the lads never, he, 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 we never used to talk about it and say, well, we've got to do this because it's dropped to six points or it's dropped to four. It was just try and win the next game, try and win the next game. Uh, so there wasn't really much communication about it in between the lads. Did so um, they panic at it? Didn't seem to be. But the results just didn't follow. We lost to the Liverpool in the famous 4-3. We obviously lost to Blackburn, and um, you know, so it was it was coming increasingly difficult. Cantona was on fire for Man United. Schmeichel was on fire for Man United. We always played. If they played on the Saturday, we play on the Sunday, and vice versa. So we're always being able to watch what they were doing because they were usually on live, and we were on live the next day, or, or vice versa as well. So. And we could see Cantona would score a last-minute winner and Schmeichel would make some brilliant saves. And I think another factor is we didn't have enough players who'd uh, been inexperienced that and won it. I think we had uh, Peter Beardsley who'd been a, 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 you know, a top-level winner. Barry Venison, Paul Bracewell. I'm not even sure if Brace was still around. He might have been at the time. And I think that was it really where Man United's full squad had experienced yeah, winning yeah, it. And yeah. they knew that it was, you know, l uh, late March, April, when there's a time where it kicked in. See, the games against Man United, who would you be up against? Keane? Keane and Scholes. And what would you give them about? The best two. They were the best two? Without a doubt. Really? Aye, they could do everything. Both, both could do everything. Could smash you, could pass could run box to box, could score, uh, what were different class. And then I had it through Coley, I had the chance to meet up with both of them uh, away from football and they were unbelievably good, great guys, very, very humble. I remember uh, when Roy was manager of Ipswich and I was manager of Huddersfield and I signed Jordan Rhodes from him. He, when we were in dialogue between each other, I left us a voicemail message and said on the voicemail, uh, Lee, it's just Roy Keane from Ipswich Town leaving a message and I thought, Roy, I know who you yeah. are. You don't need to tell us <laughs> which uh, club you're at. Hi, <laughs> everyone knows who you are. <laughs> no, yeah. But see, in game, would, would, you, would, would you be the type, obviously on your personality, would you...? I had to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with it. But verbal just... as well? No, not really. Nah. Not really. Uh, didn't really get myself involved with that once or two, twice with odd players, but just to give a bit back, it, wasn't really my scene to be honest. Do you think you were at that level with Keenan Scholes that season? Me personally? Yeah. <sighs> no, they were world class. They were world class. Uh, they, they, they were in the top top bracket. Yeah. They were in the top bracket. Do you, were you just underneath that then? Well, I've considered myself a good player, but they were they, they were world class. I mean, you know, some of the midfields that were about Vieira and Pitti were playing for Arsenal at the time. Uh, so some of the midfield players you come up against, you, were, you, you know, a young Steven Gerrard and Alonso um, I faced in my career and um, you know so there was some outstanding uh, central midfield players of that time uh, uh, Rob Lee said the poor form that led to the lead slipping was due to failing players confidence you go along with that? Well probably did because as I said to you we hadn't been a team that uh, had lost on a regular basis and during that 
end period was probably uh, when we um, when we uh, lost more games on the run than we probably ever had. Mm. So uh, you know that could be a factor. Did you just try and change anything there? Just keep going the way it was. No, we we didn't believe that things needed change because it had worked for for so long mm. and, it, and it worked for after that as well. It was just that period of time, you know. Uh, Ferguson's mind games. I wanted to ask you. He went heavy on the mind games. Could you see it affecting Keegan before his big run? Nah, as I said, he, he was um, a very emotional man, and he felt that uh, it, it, what it was is it was a Tuesday night game. We played at Ellen Road. We won the game. We were playing Forest on the Thursday, is it? Um, and then we had a game on the weekend. I, I think was the last game of the season. I think we were home to Spurs, maybe. And um, we were then at the end of the season. We we're going back to Forest to play in Stuart Pierce's testimonial. And uh, I think Sir Alex had questioned whether Forrest on the Thursday night would try because we were playing, um, we were we were taking a team and our team and all our fans to Stuart Pierce's testimonial, and that got Kevin rattled. And if you remember, he was questioning uh, the integrity of of what was being said about a man about Stuart Pierce, Pierce and Forrest because I think they ultimately beat us well on the Thursday night or drew with us, which meant. We had to win our final game and man you had to lose at Borough, which they ended up winning. And uh and they love it. I mean, he remember getting on the bus and we hadn't seen it at the time yeah. and he got on the bus and I remember and listening and he'd said to Terry Mack, she says, Oh, I've just went on the rampage on the T V. And when we seen it, I'd love it if we beat them. Love it. And we thought we weren't surprised. And you know, people talk about main games, it was just our manager showing his passion and mm -hmm. how he was. Could you just have a laugh a bit of him? Oh, aye, we had a laugh. We you used, used to him? say things to him about it, you know, love it, love it. And he had a, he had a giggle about it. It wasn't, he, he was good like that. There was no there was no big issues. There was no big deal. It wouldn't cause him a problem. Well, uh -huh. What would uh, Kevin Keegan say the day he lost the league? Man United won it. What did he say? What would he say? Uh -huh. He didn't say a lot. He didn't say a lot. If I remember rightly, he was, we were, uh, I think I remember more what he said the following summer when we were in Singapore on a Far East tour and well, we're in Bangkok, the first part of it. And he said, listen, guys, if you didn't realise you were playing for a big club, you should now. We've just broke the world transfer record to bring Alan Shearer back uh, from a team that had just um, missed out on the league. And that was basically him saying, we're not resting on our laurels. We know we've failed at the final hurdle, but now we want to go again. and." But unfortunately, didn't didn't last that season to see it through. See, when you lose a league like that on the last day, how long does it sit with you? Do you still think about the next nah, season? No, you still do, do you? Sure, I. Well, as I said, you would have been if you have that on your CV. There's no better feeling, because people talk about it being the best league in the world, and it has been. It's obviously grown and being it's a different challenge now. But even during that era, when you talk about the players. We talked about Keane and Scholes. The players that were playing in the league that year were the best and best of their best era. Of it, uh, yeah, yeah, aye, aye. Uh -huh, definitely. With the exception of maybe one or two. Uh -huh. You know, we never never got the likes of Zidane to come over, but of course. Uh, right, Shearer arrives. What, what what's so good about Alan Shearer? What because like see he's not obviously got a great touch, he can't do a step over. What is it that instantly hits you about he Alan? He has Shearer? got a he's got a very good touch to be honest, aye. Aye, he's yeah, aye. with with every part of his body, his head, his chest, his feet, um, he's uh, he's strong, he's powerful. But what Alan could do, he could adapt his game when he uh, had serious injuries. If I don't know if you've ever seen the footage uh, when he was playing for Blackburn and he burst through, and Gary Pallister, who was known as a quick centre half, then was hanging on his back because Alan was a powerful runner at the time before the injuries and he struck the ball past Michael with unbelievable power. He had ankles like tree trunks, so he used to just, when he hit the ball, it was hit. Um, he, he's, he's not huge in terms of his height. He's not like a six foot three, six foot four, but he was phenomenal in the air, either directing headers down or crosses in movement. Um, but for me, it was, it was quite surreal because you know, we're signing this player who was world class, uh, the the best of his era, the best of his type. Um, but I'd known him. I'd grown grown up at Wolves End Boys Club with him. Oh, so when we right? when we came back, it was like 
it's like seeing an old mate, you know. And it was great to have him part of your group then, and it was it was brilliant, brilliant to play. When I look back on some of the strikers that I was lucky enough to play behind as a midfield player, um, my my career was quite easy to try and. Because if you couldn't make goals for those guys, you're never going to make goals for anyone. Yeah. Was, uh, was she going to be a good trainer? Would you be an animal in trainer? Nah, no interested. All right, not bad. Finishing sessions, ridiculous. Took them ridiculously serious. Never tried to take the mickey out of goal. Keep Baz was just wanting to finish. So if he had a 100 shots one day, he wanted 100 goals. Um, five asides running, didn't really... Five asides, he'd come alive when the ball came to him. Running, didn't, not interested. No interested. Match days got them excited, and match big, the bigger the game, the the more excited they become, and the more the, the, the more of a challenge for them. And uh, I um, and obviously the, the injuries that he had, people thought they would take his toll on him. They didn't. He just what he done. He changed his game. He adapted his game, and that's a sign of any top class player that you, you can do that. And to his last year continue to score goals. He looks quite serious on the TV to me. Ah, he's a good laugh. Is he a good laugh, ah, is he? He's a different character behind the scenes. Is he? Ah, he's, uh, he, he likes the banter. He loved, he loved the football dressing room banter. Um, you know, very serious guy when it came to the football and Could he give out games. to people? Uh -huh. Thought, of course. He was a great leader. Um, and, he, and he led by example, but he also led vocally as well. So, you know, it was... Um, Listen, it was it was a fantastic uh, time to have to have been at the club to have played alongside him. Right, uh, were you shocked when Kevin Keegan resigned? As I said, it was. Oh, you spoke about Charlton away. Huh? Ah, I was seeing um, we seen it in his body language. The something wasn't right. Was that a bad thing about him that you could tell how he was feeling? By no, not really. Else? It was good. You liked it. Yeah, it was heart and his sleeve stuff. Yeah, yeah. We, we loved his passion, and uh, well, I certainly did, and then. Um, but we were gutted. Of course, this was a guy who gave us an opportunity to, to do things we never thought would ever, well, I didn't we could, uh, dream of when we local team. And so when he left the club, it was, it was a tough one, a tough one to take. Did he talk to the boys before he went? Not really, no. It was Kevin, it was Terry McDermott and Arthur Cox, the guys who um, ended up having to, to speak to us. And they took the team for a couple of games and then Kenny came in. And then another legend comes in, Kenny Dalglish. Absolutely. What a player in training. But you see, when you heard Kenny Douglas was coming, do you genuinely get excited, even though you're a proper player? Like, do you still get excited hearing oh, Kenny Douglas yeah, coming in? Of course in? you want to, because you, you, you want to learn from these guys. I mean, he'd, uh, he'd been successful at Liverpool, both as a player and a manager. He, he took a small provincial club like Blackburn to, to win the Premier League. So you're thinking, wow, this is, this is a terrific... Uh, appointment for to, to appease everybody, the players, because the players were always like looking to the owners then and say, come on, how are you going to replace Keegan. an icon like Kevin? And then Kenny came through the door and and, and, and it was different to Kevin because um, Kenny comes across quite uh, morbid on the TV as well, and very protective of his players. He, no matter what had happened in the game, would never ever criticise the team as a group or an individual, but would certainly be, you know, pointing fingers in behind closed doors. Can you go ahead? I but also was very, uh, very humorous, very funny, and uh, just another one here, a little bit of awe. He joined in training. It was like, what? This guy's are just. You'd probably think if they had the physical capabilities, Could the more. Play. Oh, aye, aye, aye. <laughs> no way. The quality was unbelievable, man. It was like. And uh, so, you know, it was just... He's, he's known for his one-liners. Have you ever heard him cut a player down? Oh, yeah. He's, 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 he's funny, he's witty, he's sharp. I mean, I've, when I've bumped into him since at various different venues, he's... Uh, he's um, I was managing Berry, and I was at the Etihad and went to watch Man City Liverpool and he was in there. And I was like, oh, how are you doing, Gaffer? And he's like, wee man, how are you? How did you enjoy Scotland? And obviously I'd put a bit of beef on. He says, well, it looks like you have. And anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, man. So he just uh, shot us down in flames. But um, no, nah, great. I only had probably four months 
playing under him because uh, towards the end of his time, I was um, I was I was hitting a bit of good form. We'd, we'd gone three games and it's, we'd, we'd scored. I'd scored in every game and I was playing well. And we had a cup tie coming up the following week and he left us out for Peter Beardsley. Now it wasn't the fact he'd left us out for Peter because I've just spoke yeah, okay, totally yeah, out yeah. highly. It's the fact that I was thought I was playing well and then I could have the chance of being left out. And that's when I'd made my decision about leaving the football club then. So that was probably about April. And then come the end of the season, we decided to move on. How did he, he react when you told him you wanted to leave? He was fine. He, listen, he, he, he explained, we want you to stay. I can't promise anyone a start. He says, we're at a big club, which I fully understood. Um, you know, we'd like you to sign a new deal, an extension. And uh, and I just said, nah, listen, it's the right time for us to go. And he, he was very respectful of that. He um, he, he allowed me and the, the club didn't price us out the market and we had one or two options. So, no, nah, it, was, it was fine. Is it a sad day when you leave? You're oh, of course it is. Yeah, of course. Tears because, there. because you're leaving the club you love and you're, uh, you're leaving, you know, pals, like, you, you know, people who you've, you've known for many, many years. And you know the club can go and achieve so many big things. Um, you know, it, it is a difficult decision because um, you're going away from a club that's been part challenging to to to, to be the, the best in the business. When did your family that say when you leave Newcastle they think you're stupid? Well, they did when I was signing my son, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> what did they say when, you, did you tell them I'm in talks with Sunderland before you well, signed? Well, yeah, I, I spoke to various different clubs. I spoke, uh, Aston Villa with Brian Little, um, Frank Clark, Manchester City, Jim Smith with Derby, who were Premier League. Aston Villa were obviously Premier League. Um, Celtic and Rangers, Dick Avakar and Tommy Burton, late great Tommy Burns. And um, Sunderland was the last club I met. And I remember meeting Reedy in Manchester and says, listen, Peter, I've come out of courtesy. Paul Bracewell, who I'd played alongside and played a big part of my career, he was Peter's assistant. And he'd asked, his, he'd set up the meeting, and I basically said to uh, said to Peter, I'd come out with respect that he'd asked the meeters, and there was no way I was going to sign. And six bottles of Lauren Perry <laughs> earlier, I signed a five-year contract. <laughs> Is he a top man, Peter? It was different class. He, he, he was he was in a line of managers that I loved playing for. He got the best out of his. He was a great motivator, a great manager. He assembled a great group of players and I had two great years under him. So did you phone your phone your dad and say I'm signing for Sunderland? Well, what had happened is I came back, this was on a Friday and I, meet, I met them through my friends and father-in-law for a drink in town and tell them that I'd agreed to sign for Sunderland and it was a bit of a shock for everyone. So it took, a, well, it, it, this, uh, it, they, they never got round the, the, in their heads that I'd uh, that I'd uh, signed for them. In my second season, the first game of the season, I broke my leg. My wife and two oldest children were away on holiday. My father-in-law and his mates came in. Uh, I had an executive box at the stadium of light and they came in the box to watch the game. We meant to meet up after the game and I was in hospital, obviously I'd broke my leg after about half an hour. And uh, I was wondering where they were. They're like, no one had been in touch with us and no one had been to see us at the hospital. So I rang them and I could hear music in the background and they were in Newcastle City Centre. And they said, where are you? We're waiting for you. And I says, well, you must know where I am. He says, no, why? I says, I'm in hospital. I broke my leg. Did you not see the incident? And they says, oh, to be fair, we shut the curtains in the box and we just got on the drink. We didn't watch the match. Ah, <laughs> oh, brilliant, man. So is the rivalry, obviously we know Celtic and Rangers up in Scotland. Is it similar? No, no, it's not on no. that level. It's, 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 it's a club rivalry right. and it's not the, the no, religion you know, and uh, yeah and it's so I used to always I was this was in the championship I was playing my son in Newcastle obviously in the Premier League and I, I used to still go back and watch Newcastle whenever I could did you right? oh yeah all the time and there was there was never any issues I never was friendly banter but it never got you know heat, no no it never got heated and it never got derogatory and it never got um, uh, you know it won't become an issue. Would the other Sunderland all. players give you a bit for it or would they not bother? Nah, it was, hey, listen, the scene, what I was there for when I was in, in, yeah, with, in the group and, uh, and trained and played and, and, and they just cracked on, you know? What was it like putting the strip on for the first time? Saying Ajax at the, um, 
stadium of light and uh, to open in the stadium and it was fine. I got into it and then my first home game there we beat Man City. Me, Niall Quinn and Kevin Phillips scored, I think. So How good are they sort of place? They were, well, they were top class. That was an unbelievable strike force. Mm -hmm. uh, we had Michael Bridges, a young striker who couldn't get in the team at the time. Le Leeds, he put there. Like Leeds, yeah, 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 yeah. Player, Champions yeah. League, very good player. And Kevin and Quinny were phenomenal. When you see Niall Quinn from afar, you think he's just this big six foot four target man, but he had a, he had a magnificent touch and he, he, you know, was great to play alongside him. Easy for a midfield player again. And Kevin was an unknown and uh, just brilliant. Uh -huh. uh, Peter Reid, as you said, top man, but he could he could blow his top, couldn't he? Oh, what worst you've seen him? He kicked us up the backside in bottom of, bottom of my hamstring at Redden. I was awful. We played at Redden. I think we lost four 0 and I was useless and. Uh, he volleyed us and, and said something along the lines of, I've just wasted four million quid on you. And <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I had great, great respect for him. And, but he was a tough guy, a tough, tough manager. What, to please like? Aye. But he was, if you did it, if you, you know, he would, he, he was brilliant. He was brilliant to play for. Alex Ray, did you play with him? Played with Alex. Great How was he a madman? Good, good player. What the man? Crazy. Great player, in fact. Was he a great player? Uh, I don't do him a disservice. I enjoyed playing alongside him. Um, you know, he was uh, he was a good, funny guy, funny guy in the dressing room, um, in the training ground. Um, there's actually I've got a there's a picture of me and him at the training ground, and he's obviously seeing something, and I'm just in a fit of laughter. Um, and that was on a regular occurrence at the tra on the training pitch, and usually the butt of his jokes was Quinny. When he's dressed sense, so he used to get a bit of stick. Uh, about a few that. people admit, is it terrible, huh? Uh, Aye. Your wife addresses him? Well, it looked that way. Uh. Yeah. It looked that way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you won the first division your second season, 105 points. Uh, was it your intention to stay for the Premier League after that? Um, well, it was difficult because I couldn't see myself playing for Sunderland against Newcastle. Oh, really? Yeah, and that was my thoughts. And um, I'd already informed Peter that I was looking to leave, but he wasn't having any of it. And then obviously the incident with the T-shirt just, you know, made it untenable. See, the morning you done that, were you thinking, what were you? Well, I only had it on for 30 seconds. People seemed to think that I was wearing it around the streets of London. Right. Um, when I jumped out the black cab, it got thrown on us and then the pictures got taken. I remember my father-in-law saying that, uh, oh, that could come back to haunt you. And I said, do you think? And so, uh, <laughs> you know, when it came out in the public domain, it was... Uh, made my position untenable. Which, when I look back now, when I'm older, um, more mature, you just think uh, it's a shame because I only played for three clubs and two of them I get welcomed back with open arms and the other one where I had two great seasons, voted player of the year, that they find it difficult to, to forgive and forget, which I, I totally understand. Do you remember the first time Peter had spoke to you after it? He was, he was in the south of France. I was in the, the boardroom with the chairman and my agent and the chairman was obviously saying it was untenable. My position would have to sell us. And Peter was adamant that the fixtures had just come out and the first game of the season was at Stamford Bridge against Chelsea. And uh, was adamant that um, I'd be in the team. He wasn't letting us go. And, really? Uh, yeah, you wanted yeah. to keep you after that? Oh, yeah, you? yeah, yeah. He, he said we could ride out the storm. and Because uh, obviously he knew and I'd spoke to him to say that once we'd got promoted, uh, we'd, I mean, we'd secured the league quite early and we got to the semi-final of the League Cup as well. I think it was known as the Carlin Cup then. And we got beat off Leicester over two legs. Neil Lennon was playing for Leicester and after the second leg, I went in to see him and Andy Gray was doing Sky. I just said, listen, next season's going to be difficult. It's probably easier if I move on with the opportunity. Um, and he was like, nah, nah, it's not happening. So he obviously was thinking this was a way of me getting out with a T-shirt and he wasn't going to allow it. But when the phone went down, Bob Murray, the chairman of Sunderland, then just reiterated that I couldn't hang about. Did you want to hang about now? You he couldn't. Do? He couldn't. Uh -huh. it, it, did, you get, did you get quite a bit of abuse for Sunderland? Ah, uh, yeah, I got a, quite a bit of stick. And, and rightly so. Is it scary? And, well, n not so, so much. Um, but, you know, I understood. You 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 can't you can't bite the hand that feeds you. You still got the t-shirt. <laughs> it was never mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Fulham then. Fans say we moved into London. 
fantastic, best decision I made. Really? Never ever thought I'd go and live in London. Whenever I played there, I thought the place was massive, daunting, when I used to walk about pre-match. Um, but it was an unbelievable move. A club on the up, uh, crazy owner. But what was owner that, like? You got any stories about him? Mad. Brought Michael Jackson in the dressing room. <laughs> um, said, hey, do you see these lads? He has Michael. Um, <laughs> Tony Curtis, the old famous actor. Yeah. Did Michael Jackson speak when he came in? Mm, didn't show, say a lot. The guy was throwing rose petals down on the train on the dressing room floors. He walked in, and so we had. Uh, <laughs> but he, what he done is the owner. He, um, he invested a lot of money. We had an unbelievable training ground that he was making better and better all the time, keeping updated. It was difficult for him to do anything with the ground. I don't know if you've played at Craven Cottage, but, but, it, but it's. Um, it's right in the middle of a, a house in the state, isn't it? Yeah, which is, you know, houses are worth a lot of money there. One of the stands backs onto the Thames. So he had some big plans, but there was quite a bit of, a, you know, response that they didn't want, you know, workmen in there. So I it was you were in there. <laughs> it was probably, that was probably the thing, yeah. So, but what a club, what people, what a place to live. My family loved it. And, uh, no, it's uh, six, six brilliant years. Was it the chairman that you met at first, or was it the manager? Um, it was Paul Bracewell who was the manager, who signed his. And then I met the owner uh, when I was doing my medical. And um, What did he first say to you when you first signed? Oh, it was just, just, just crazy. Just, you know, it was just some of the things he'd done. It was like, but he was very uh, generous to the families, to the, to the children, to the staff. Um, you know, got the old Harrods discount cards and know? that and all that, yeah, we're there regular and big parties were more successful in the main restaurant in Harrods and looked after us unbelievably. Um, no, it was just, just a phenomenal phenomenal time in a, in a great part of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever get a pint with Michael Jackson there? No, I didn't get a pint with Michael Jackson, no. no I'm, I'm not, um, you know, I'm, I don't think the lad's got a sing song with him either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, John T. Garner was, came in as manager. What a legend, eh? Absolutely, absolutely. What a great manager. Took it to a new level in terms of the modern day work, in terms of fitness, dietary stuff. We were training three times a day, sometimes six o'clock in the morning, ten o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the afternoon. So what, you never minded that? Oh, we, had, we, we had to. We either, got, we either liked it or we got out. He was in charge and he had the back end of the owner. And Is he quite was, strict? Uh, yeah, very, very, and um, very demanding. Uh, all about total football again, though, but we were super fit and uh, got us into the Premier League, got us into Europe. Um, so the, the, the club was in the up. We were, to get a club like that competing in European competition was, was fantastic. Who was your mates uh, in the film there? Chris Coleman ended up becoming my manager. Uh -huh. Very good pals. He's gorgeous as well, isn't he? Uh, aye. A story, we played Liverpool and he was manager and uh, I was the captain of the club and um, Liverpool were making a sub. Rafa Benitez was bringing Milan Barris on and uh, don't know if you remember the, uh, the striker. Check, check striker. Chris waved us over and uh, I thought he was going to say something tactically and he said, uh, good luck and any. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, eh? I said, good looking, because he was like a mini version of Chris. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it was like, wow. It was, uh, he could break up the uh, the seriousness with good stuff. And, um, but John, you know, took the club to a new level. Chris suffered a serious injuries in a car accident and his career had to stop in terms of the play and went on to the coaching staff. And then when John moved, Chris, Chris took over and was, was the uh, youngest ever Premier League manager at the time. I remember in one of his, before, he, I think it was five games left of the season where he was a caretaker manager. We, I think we won three, drew one and lost one, which got him the job ultimately. In one of those games, his first home game, I think, was Vigna Castle, and I scored the winner, past year given. And um, so I keep saying to him, listen, remember who got you the, the job, job at Fulham I, and uh, So see, when you were a captain, he was the manager, we used to go for a beer and after games? Um, or did you need to change? Yeah, he, he had to change a little bit in terms of that. Um, it, it was difficult because our families were really close as well. Our children right. uh, were close. So he had to be a little bit, you know, managerial side of it. But there was, there was lots of occasions where him and his staff 
um, would would socialise with the players in any way because he wanted to try and have this the, this group together. Yeah. So, um, but obviously it, it had to change. Um, so. Right. Uh, I need to ask you about a player who I loved, Louis Saha. Unbelievable. We Up signed, there with your Shearers and your. Well, he was. He, I mean, when you're talking Shearer, you're talking top Different, of the tree, yeah. but. He was certainly when I list the top strikers. I mean, a couple of years we had him at Fulham. We were, I think we only paid Mets one point eight million for him, and um, he he was just r ridiculous. An animal, what, what a leap! Uh, what a touch! And he was finished athletic. And he obviously got the move to Man United for seventeen million. We were actually that's when the, the the transfer windows had started coming in, and it was the January transfer window. And I think we were third or fourth top at the time. And for a club like Fulham to be yeah. third or fourth top of the Premier League was ridiculous. And we thought if we kind of held on to him, we could have possibly maybe he's got, we might, even if we had a drop, still got in the top six. But on deadline day, he got sold to Man United and we found it, Chris found it difficult as the manager to replace him. And certainly he weren't going to get a player of that le level, of that quality. And we ended up finishing ninth, which was still a club record high at the time in the Premier League. Um, but we just felt that if he had stayed, because he, he, he could have been, he was a match winner on his own yeah. at times um, in that 4 2 3 1 system. He was perfect because he was so dynamic, his movement was brilliant, he had terrific touch, he was playing with a lot of confidence, he was, he had a, his leap was, was terrific. Um, so we, we, we could have easily finished in the top six if he had hung around. and. In a January window, when you lose your best player like that, it is difficult yeah, yeah. to replace them. Difficult to replace them. You played with some top players. One player, who's the best you've played with? Well, when I, when I think about all the strikers I played with throughout my career, so if I take it from the start, Mickey Quinn, David Kelly, Gavin Peacock, Andy Cole, Peter Beardsley, um, Ferdinand. Les Ferdinand. Alan Shearer, Fastino Aspria, Kevin Phillips, Mick, uh, Niall Quinn, Niall Quinn um, Louis Saha, um, Michael Owen. Um, just ridiculous array of strikers. But we have to pick one, who are you picking? In terms of the striker? No, a player that well, you like played Peter. Peter. Peter Beardsley? Yeah. Better than the best? Uh, I mean, this and some of them, some of them were you know, Stevie Finnan was a fantastic a footballer player, and a playing great career for Liverpool. Yeah, uh, Champions League win, didn't he? It's hard because how do you how do you not pick a Shearer like who, who's just smashed every record going and But just the one that you you enjoyed playing with the most. Uh, in terms of enjoyment, it'd be Shearer, yeah. Shearer. Mm -hmm. What about best guy you've met? I love this question. Best guy in football? Best guy in football. Made you laugh the most. Where's oh, Ferdinand? Oh, Ferdinand was the best guy. Uh, oh, what was so good about Ferdinand? Just brilliant. It's a lovely man. Funny, but humble, respectful, treat everyone the same, spend time with your wife, your family, your brothers, no, no, your too sisters. Much time with your wife at home. No, no, well, that's <laughs> one, one area where you, 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 if that happens, there's no going back. Your, 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 your history. <laughs> Well, and last, uh, last one on the teammates, funniest? Funniest. David Batty was a funny guy, very yeah. funny guy. Alex Ray, unbelievably funny guy. Had some great laughs. Chris Coleman was high up there, very funny. What well, was Chris Coleman's part of like slotting people? Uh, yeah, just like one liners and, uh, you know, about club or what car you drove or whatever and, and just, just cutting like just brilliant love that banner brilliant uh, right just finally second spell at Newcastle uh, was it surreal when Newcastle got in contact with you to go back did well, you ever think it would happen again never never I was on the verge of going I was still living down south I was on the verge of going to Southampton and then I potentially could have a chance to go to Leeds and out the blue Terry McDermott was one of uh, Graeme Souness's assistants and he rang us and says come you know, pre-season had started and I didn't have a club. This was the first time I didn't have a club. My contract ran out of Fulham. And uh, he says, come, come. You know, he knew I was coming home for a while. Come in and train with us. Just keep yourself fit, football fitness. Because you know what it's like, training in the gym to football fitness is completely yeah. different. You know, you have 
six weeks in a gym and you try and play a competitive football match yeah, like a pre-season, it, it's, it doesn't get you right. So you need football training. So I came in and after about five or six days, Graeme Souness got us in and says, listen, I like what I'm seeing. He says, you're an experienced player. Um, I'd like you in around the group. He says, you mightn't get a lot of game time, but if I need you in emergencies, he says, but what also I know you, you're doing your coaching badges. You've got to, you've got to, uh, you want to become a coach. He says, you can, um, you can, you know, be mentored by Tommy Craig, who Tommy was taking the, uh, the, the reserve team. So what I've done is I, I registered as a player coach and um, was then becoming, uh, getting mentored by Tommy to, on the coaching side. But after about three or four games, Graham, Graham put me in the team. I think we didn't get a result in the first three games. We had a hard run and then we went to Blackburn and he started his and we beat Blackburn 3-0. And uh, I ended up playing 25, 30 times. So what a player. It was, it was I. It was just like, wow. And he asked surreal. you, so what, what's soonest? Like, obviously, another legend. <laughs> thought he was brilliant because, and the reason I thought he was brilliant, he wasn't a very popular choice. He was took over from Bobby, Sir Bobby Robson. And the team didn't, weren't getting great results, and he was under a lot of pressure. And he never, uh, he never looked like a man under pressure. He never passed that into the players. He never showed we had like some young players in the group. We had a young Charles and Zobby at the time. He was on fire then, wasn't he? Aye, Charles could have been, you know, was a terrific young talent. Um, but the manager was the proper man. Yeah. He, you know, he uses that word. He's one of the few pundits I love watching. Yeah, he's brilliant, isn't he? Um, could, he could he give, give a player a bit of her? Oh, when he used to join in, he could, he would leave one of his naughty tackles in. Yeah, I, smash in uh, well, no, no, I kept that out of his way. I knew what, yeah. I knew what he was capable of, but he was... Uh, Presence about him, isn't he? Some, some player. I mean that era that he. I, mean, I was. I'm very good friends with Terry McDermott and worked with him both as a player and a, and a manager for many years. It was managed by Daglish and managed by Souness. Keegan obviously won a few, but those three, the medal collection from that era, wow. were just phenomenal. It was like, uh, and and just had loads of respect for for Souness. Had uh, another icon of the game, and, and I just found him to be. A, a real top bloke who protected his players and was an example of me of when when the pressure's on, you know, how to go about things. Uh, Michael Lundkin, a lot's been made in the press recently about him and Shearer. Uh, how, how did you find Michael? Well, I've, I've just said, I've, I've, I've been asked many times since the book's been uh, brought out and, and been serialised that what's been said hasn't surprised us. He looked like a player who didn't want to be with us. He didn't look at ease at the club. He didn't buy into a lot of the things in the community or into the fan base. Everyone to that own. So I just, yeah, I didn't. I, I did he pull him up back in for that? No, nah, I wasn't. I wasn't really surprised that. Hey, listen, he's still in the early times. I mean, I remember at West Brom away and uh, Blackburn, and there was another game where West Ham. Where he, he looked what he was, a world class striker, but um, you know, the injuries were a big issue. Um, and I just felt when when the serialisation of the book came out ten days ago, two weeks ago, that it wasn't really a, it wasn't a shock to me what yeah. he was saying, because it, it looked that way. It looked that way to, to, to someone who was sharing a dressing room with him. Do you ever uh, got the horses when we were there? Uh, yeah, we went we went to horse race meetings. Uh, he's uh, Use of his helicopter and all that, and um, so it's it's sad to find that um, he's had to use the book to 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 be derogatory about um, the Newcastle fans, the club. You know, because what 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 mystifies me is he says in the book that the the owner of Madrid had said they accepted the bid from Newcastle, but they didn't they weren't pushing him out the door. So if he didn't really want to come to Newcastle, stay stay at Real Madrid, stay yeah. you know and. Um, so, um, it, it, they tried to portray it as a similar one to the, when they signed Shearer and they had the big, they had opened the stand stadium, at the stadium yeah. and there was 20 odd thousand there and they had the big press conference. But it's, it's probably easy to say it didn't, uh, it didn't pan out like Shearer's. Shearer's going to end up ragdolling him, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't have thought there'll be, uh, 
they'll be think. sitting down for dinner together yeah. anytime soon. Uh, just finally on Newcastle, uh, did no other team match the buzz that you got for uh, as playing with Newcastle? No, I love, I, I love Fulham. I love my did time you? at Fulham. I had two great years at Fulham, but I love my time at Fulham. The club's so special to us. But nothing's going to ever replace the buzz of playing for your hometown club, seeing your, your mum and your dad and your brothers and sisters, your wife, your, your children. Because uh, uh, fortunately, me... My third child, he wasn't born first time I played round, but second time he was he born, whether he was old enough to understand, I don't know, that's another thing, but uh, they had that chance to, to see me pl pull on the famous black and white shirt. How emotional was the last final appearance? Well, I didn't actually know at the time it was. It was a V Chelsea at St James's Park, and a result that got us into Europe, and um, we uh, the injuries had took that toll, so they were becoming an issue, and... Um, so we, uh, I decided that summer to knock, knock the plane on the head and concentrate on the next stage. Yeah, we, uh, we emotional. Are you of course, there's, there's been times where I thought that you know, could I reverse the decision? But I always felt it was the right one. Have you found the rigors of management since you got in it? And who did you take most from as well? Sorry, oh, I took things from all my managers, various different things and positives. I always say I, I feel like I was so lucky that the managers I played under always give us. Uh, positive uh, feedback and so you take a lot of things from them all. It's changed since I first took the job at Huddersfield to what it is now in terms of, um, you know, whereas in the start, um, players and agents would come to the manager if they wanted any if issues resolved, if they wanted a new contract and find out how they were playing. Now it's probably the deal direct with chief executives and owners. So the manager is more like a head coach. Um, the do you, know, like, do you on. Not like that as much? Not as do much. The pressure's, on, on the pressure's on straight away, whatever level you're working at, because the turnaround in the, in the situation with social media. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a tough old gig. That was some run you went on with Huddersfield, didn't it? I was doing it, It's the something time. that... You, you, Still you proud know. of it? Aye. I mean, it's not been beaten 43 games, beaten the great, the late great Brian Clough, an icon. So um, now it's something you, you look back on. And I've tried to do the similar things at the other clubs that I've had and to try and repeat it and bring in similar type of players to what I had, but it's been near on impossible. Uh, need to ask you about Scottish football. Uh, what was your first impression when you joined Command? You've Loved done great it. first season, didn't you? Well, we, we, we kept them up. And then in the summer of the second season, we uh, we rebuilt the squad. And when I left, I shouldn't have left. I shouldn't have took, when Berry come calling, I should have stayed at Kilmarnock. They tried to get us to stay. Only had one full year, calendar year there. And um, we were sixth in a tight league. And I, we, we, I should have stayed. I, I, I got trapped brilliantly. The, the standard of the football was far higher than people make out down south. You manage at Celtic Park, you manage at Ibrox, you manage at Petaudry, at Tynecastle. Hibs weren't in the league then, but we knew they were going to come up. So, you know, it's it's probably an, an area where I, I regret that I should have stayed there for longer. Big Lee McCulloch, your assistant manager, how great, did you find him? Great guy, brilliant help, him and Peter Leaving, two terrific guys, got on really well. Legend in Scotland, obviously. I wouldn't go as far as legend, but... Uh, <laughs> but, uh, no, nah, listen... Two, two brilliant fellas and uh, help help me a lot because obviously to, to get to know about the Scottish game and what it was about. Big McCulloch says to ask you about the Steve Bruce story. <laughs> Steve Bruce for Nicholas Bent. Uh -huh. Aye. In, uh, when he was uh, dating his wife. Uh, his he's not his wife, his daughter, sorry. He'd certainly be upset if he was dating his wife. <laughs> ah, he was... Uh, well, Nicholas was a young player at Birmingham, wasn't he? And he was... Um, he, was, he wasn't the shyest as everyone's come across and uh, you know it was. He turns up back home for lunch and there's Nicholas Bentner lying on his couch in his front room. He wasn't too pleased <laughs> <laughs> with the Sky remote changing the channels. <laughs> That's tremendous, isn't it? I uh, love it. Uh, just on Kelly, are you still looking for the results? Absolutely. I've been up a few times since. Oh, have you been back? Have aye, you aye, to watch games. Um, and uh, thought, you know, brilliant with, the, with the, getting them into Europe. Um, nah, club, that's, you know, a, a, a real fondness for, real fondness. Manager's not doing too great, I'm not on a headline out here, that, but would, would you be open to returning back, <laughs> back to come on? He's, he's turned the corner, it was a tough start, and, yeah. uh, but I, yeah, it certainly looks, Scottish football wouldn't be an issue for me to go back and, and manage in that, definitely.
Lee, top man, thanks very much. Cheers, Simon. Cheers, Thank mate, you. Man.